Good morning. morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. Today, we're going to talk about rejection and acceptance. And it made me think of a story about a guy named Bob. Bob worked at a kind of big company, and his job was to do the financial reports. So he'd get all these things, you know, the P&L, how are we doing? And he'd report to his boss, who wasn't the top guy, Mr. Smith. Well, Mr. Smith would report to Mr. Umberman. He was the top guy. He was the CEO, if you will. So here's the thing. Bob wanted to climb the corporate ladder. He wanted to be successful, so approval meant a lot to him. But his boss seemed to always be rejecting him. So every month, (laughs) happened to someone, every month (laughs) Bob would hand in the report. And Mr. Smith would be somewhat dismissive of it and throw it kind of in the bin and then say something bad about last month's report. Like, but vague though. Like it wasn't well written. What does that mean? I don't know, but every month, he try to make it perfect, but the same result. Eh, not well written. Okay. Somebody's got to get that. <laughs> so he decides coffee. I'm going to find out what kind of coffee he likes, how he likes it, ask his secretary. I'm going to bring him a coffee. Sweeten the pot. So he does. But the same thing. He just takes a sip of the coffee, throws a report to the side. Not well written. Okay. Donuts. If I put something in his mouth, he can't say anything, right? So good strategy, finds out from his secretary what's his favorite kind of donut. Boston cream, mine too. So that's why it's in there. Anyway, so (laughs) he brings the donuts and everything, right? Same thing with the report, but look, Mr. Smith, I have donuts for you. Look inside the box, right? Oh, my favorite, Boston cream. And so as he's eating the donut, it gives the secretary from upstairs time to come down and get the report. But here's the thing. Mr. Smith didn't even look at it. So she just takes the report and brings it up to Mr. Umberman. All right, that's weird. Next month, let me, let me try this again. Remove the donuts and just see what happens. So brings it down, gives him the report, dismisses the report, puts it in the tray, and Bob just kind of stares at him for a little while. Wants to see what happens. Sure enough, secretary comes down, picks up the report. Wait a minute. Bob leaves and he starts winding himself up. Hold on. He's not even reading these reports. (laughs) That's why it's so vague every month. And then he keeps like winding himself up. He's in his own head now. He's getting mad. He's boiling over and he's thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm doing this guy's job. He doesn't do anything at all. He's mad. So now he wants to get revenge. I'm going to spit in his coffee. (laughs) Nice guy, right? So he's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to get him fired. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to botch the report next month. Not only that, I'm going to write it in his name And I'm going to say things in there that will get him. Umberman, Mr. Umberman, Mr. Dumberman. (laughs) You know, so I think Mr. Dumberman is a dummy Dumberman. And just on and on and on about this. CEO's name, sign off him, whatever. I got him. The day finally comes. He goes into Smith's office. He's not there. But in comes the secretary again. Ah, Bob. Just the person I want to see. I'll take that report. Now he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so they have that kind of comical thing. With the phone. Just give it to me. I'm going to take it. It's Mr. Umberman. Uh, and by the way, he wants to see you. Okay. So he goes up to the office. He's in the waiting room. That's the longest five minutes of his life. She has brought the report in already. So he is sweating. Okay, he'll see you now. He goes in the office. And the CEO is doing what a good CEO or pastor does sometimes. He doesn't say anything. You know, wait, see what he says. And so Bob's real uncomfortable. He's sweating. He, well, I know Mr. Smith wasn't there. And now I'm, he comes right in. I know he's not there. I fired him. 
great. This guy's in a firing mood now. No. All right, well, why did you fire him? He can't help himself. He's got to know. He's just talking to Phil Spacey. Why did you fire him? He's like, well, you see on the back of this report here, there's a place where Smith should have been stamping it and signing it. So I know he didn't write any of these reports. <laughs> no. Bob's like, oh, I'm dead. Right? So there's no chance it's him. He's fired. No, 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 no. Yep. He hasn't written any of them. And in fact, I know you have been writing the reports. Now, sweat. Just sweat. So don't stress out. It's okay. It's just a story. So sweat. He's just sweating. Oh, no. Here it comes. He's in a firing mood. I'm going to get canned. So you know what, Bob? We want to give you his job. Ooh, that's good. So moment of happiness and excitement, but soon dwindles. Why? <laughs> Still got the report there. He's got to do something about it. Think, 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 think. Oh, wait, 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 sir. I, I want to sign the report, though. I'm going to reread it and sign it because I wouldn't want to get fired for the same thing the other guy did. Mm, okay. Thank you, thank you. I, I'm, I'm going to sign this. So he thinks... Got away with it. He's on his way out the door. Oh, wait, Bob, Mr. Umberman says. My name begins with a U, not a D. <laughs> Today, we will be talking about rejection and acceptance, and maybe sometimes getting off the hook a little bit or not. <laughs> Last week, we talked about humility. We saw that John the Baptist was very humble. Jesus, indeed, was humble. Today we're going to hop right in. You know, if you've been here for a while, the Bible is not in chronological order. Uh, last week it ran straight through. That was pretty nice. This week we're going to hop around again. So you kind of got, I don't like to use the term, but it's the way we think now, a like copy and paste, if you will. So let's put the chart up. And this is what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, John 4, uh, starting in that chapter, Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Now, the woman at the well, if you will. A lot of you know that. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on that, so maybe it'll be helpful in understanding what's at play here and in our theme today of acceptance and rejection. As a result, many Samaritans believe, we hop over to Luke, we see that John, John the Baptist, is imprisoned. We'll get back to him later. Uh, then Jesus' ministry actually begins. We saw he kind of initiated it with that fasting, but now it begins. Then Jesus heals the official's son, and then he's rejected at Nazareth. So we see an end cap here of acceptance and rejection. Let's hop right in. John 4.1. Jesus, literally the Lord, knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well around noontime. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Good time to pause. So let's look at the background there. If you remember way back in the rest of the story, you had the split, Israel and Judah. You might know about King David, right? If you never read the Bible, David and Goliath. Solomon, you might know about him too, really wise guy, but... He broke every rule set forth, Deuteronomy 17, for a king. Right? So he's really bad. God wanted to destroy him in the kingdom, but for your father's sake, he said, I won't. But I'm going to do it to your son in successive generations. Rehoboam comes along, makes some bad decisions. The kingdom splits. So you have Judah in the south, where Jerusalem is, and that's where all the legit worship is going on. So you have that tribe there. There's 12 tribes of Israel. The Levites will come there too. So sometimes it'll just say 10 and 2, but Benjamin's there too. So anyway, the rest of the tribes are in the north. Jeroboam is ruling them. He does the whole thing with the calf idols, not good, and Bethel and Dan doubling down on the sin of Aaron. But about six kings later, Omri buys Samaria. He sets up the capital in the north, Jerusalem south, capital in the north is Samaria. He is wicked Ahab's dad. 
It'll refer, Jesus will reference him later. It's kind of neat. So around the time of Elijah and Elisha, the prophets, wicked Ahab. So Omri sets up the capital city, Samaria, hence Samaritans. Israel in the north falls first. They're more wicked. They worship other gods more often. Again, the calf idols. They're not doing the legit worship in Jerusalem. And so they're known to, I think, Judah, Jewish people, to the Jewish people as being like kind of half-breeds too because they're mixing in with other cultures. They're kind of not supposed to do that either. So that's the thing. The Samaritans are known as these half-breed to the Jews, half-breed people. They don't really do the right worship either. They couldn't, right? They don't have Jerusalem. So the worship is in Mount Gerizim instead of on this mountain. We're going to see that in a second. That's the background. And this is why the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? This is why Jesus is always using Samaritans as an example to knock the Jewish people who think they're all that in a bag of chips, right? So and that's exactly what he said. So <laughs> anyway, that's why he's doing that, right? So he's like, even the Samaritans better than you. So that's what's going on here. This is the picture. He's asking a Samaritan woman to give him a drink of water. Okay, so it's already unusual. So <laughs> she says, you know, what? You know, we don't have anything to do with one another. Jesus, <laughs> if you only knew the gift God had for you, 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 and who you're speaking to, you ask me for water, right? and I'd give you the water that leads to eternal life. Now, she doesn't get it, so she's like, wait a minute, you're better than Jacob? Like Jacob? He and his ancestors and even his animals drank from this well. How are you better? Plus, you don't even have a bucket, right? So she's thinking very practically here. Jesus says, look, anyone who drinks of that water, you're going to get thirsty again. But you drink the water I have, you'll never be thirsty again. Again, eternal life here. So the woman gets excited. Please, sir, give me some of that water. Then I won't have to keep coming to the well and getting it. <laughs> she doesn't get it, right? Jesus knows this. So it's kind of like a Nathaniel moment from last week. He's going to blow her mind. Go get your husband. I don't have a husband. I know, you've answered correctly. For you've had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. Ooh. Interesting in Greek here. In Greek, the word for husband or man is exactly the same. And so you have to decide how you're going to change that. Some denominations get some interesting theology that way. But anyway, so it could change. But it's easy to understand if you think of him saying... Yeah, you've had five men, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. It makes it easy to understand. That's the criticism. So she realizes, wow, you must be a prophet. And Jesus is patient for a sec, right? You must be a prophet. So tell me why. And she goes into this thing. You Jews worship in Jerusalem. We worship on Mount Gerizim. Ah. So he goes into famous teaching. Believe me, <laughs> the time is here even, right? So it will come. When true worshipers, it won't matter, it doesn't matter, this mountain, that mountain, we're going to worship in spirit and in truth. Those who worship the Father will worship in spirit and in truth. Well, she says, I know the Messiah is coming. He'll explain all this to us. I am the Messiah, Jesus says. Now, just then two things happen. The disciples come back and they're like, this is weird. Why is he talking to a woman by himself? Culturally, that would have been a bad thing, especially a man of Jesus' stature, a rabbi, is what they're calling him. But they don't say anything to Jesus. So, eh, like, this is kind of awkward and weird. The woman now goes back, and she's like, I think I found the Messiah. He knew everything about me. So these two things are happening simultaneously. Then we get into a lesson about spiritual food. It was spiritual drink before. Now it is spiritual food. They're like, Jesus, eat something. You must be hungry. And then he goes on to the spiritual food teaching. So we have those things at play here. My nourishment comes from doing the will of God, he says. So think about the retort that he gave to Satan when he was tempted. Man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see that theme in here. As a result of this whole thing, again, the woman's like, come see the man that told me everything I knew about myself. He's the Messiah. And so he stays with them for two days. And Many Samaritans who are, and this is the real gravity of this teaching, who have been rejected by the Jewish people are now accepted by Jesus. So you see this happening right there. That's the beautiful picture of what's going on if you know your Old Testament. There's some value there. 
So now I'm going to kind of go over a couple of the other sections and we'll get to Jesus being rejected, stay in our theme. But here's the chronology. John is imprisoned. Uh, he is kind of publicly criticizing Herod Antipas, saying, you can't have your brother's wife, Herodias, and that's going to get him in some trouble. We'll see that later, but it just mentions he's thrown in prison. Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Jesus' ministry begins. This is a really cool place where uh, you can see the good reasoning behind having three gospel accounts, essentially three accounts of the same thing. It gives us kind of different information here. Luke lets us know he's around 30 years old when he begins his ministry. You get a quote from Isaiah 9, the Greek version, uh, in Matthew. And then Mark will say just about the same thing. What Jesus is doing is saying what John is, was saying was repent of your sins, right? Repent of your sins. Obey God. Believe in God. The kingdom is here. In John 4, this is an interesting one because people confuse it. It's really easy to confuse. Je Jesus heals an official son. Herod, we were just talking about him in the chronology. He probably works, based on the Greek word, he probably works for Herod. So he is probably not a Gentile. And it's his son that he wants healed. Also, he has a personal interaction with him. He's face-to-face -face with Jesus, and Jesus basically rebukes him. Well, you, he asks, you got to heal my son. He's going to die. But he says, will you not believe, like, unless I do all these miracles? The one people confuse it with is the centurion, the gen, but he's a Gentile. It's different. He sends people to Jesus, and then Jesus applauds his faith. I haven't even seen faith like this in all of Israel. So he uses a Gentile people, and we'll see the person to, to kind of critique the Jews, essentially. So this is this account. Essentially, Lord... Heal my little boy. You know, he's healed. Go home. Messengers come out to tell the guy before he gets there on the way, your son's healed. When, when did this happen? Yesterday, around 1 o'clock. He knows that Jesus did it without even being there. So many come to believe as a result. Now if we continue, Jesus is rejected in Nazareth, Luke 4.16. When Jesus came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. Good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He's quoting Isaiah 61, Greek version. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. He began to speak to them. Then they began, he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. But how can this be, they asked. Isn't this Joseph's son? And then he said, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb. Physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your own hometown like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Certainly, there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land. Yet, Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy at the time of the prophet Elisha after Elijah. But the only one healed was Naaman, a Syrian. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of a hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. So very interesting here, using these foreigners to criticize the Jewish people, right? Your own people. So you see this contrast here, being accepted right, by people that are not your people, also rejected by your own people, all in that thing. Right there. And you can see it during the time of Ahab again. Kind of interesting to know the Old Testament a little. So we see this theme in this section. From the Samaritans being accepted to Jesus being rejected. Accepted by a people that are not your people or that don't like you. And rejected by your own people is the theme. So what I want to talk about are both sides of that. Both sides of that situation, what a lot of people struggle with. And so I want to start with the rejection. Because a lot of people, and if we're being honest, probably from my desk, what I see as a pastor, everybody. 
has a fear of rejection. It's a little bit in there somewhere. Somewhere in there is a fear of rejection. And this could be in a lot of things. We work through this in a lot of stuff. Um, it could be something simple like, you know, uh, applying for a job, which is not simple. I shouldn't have said that, but <laughs> applying for a job. Right? You're afraid of rejection. Some people won't even apply for certain jobs because they're just, ah, I'm not going to get that job. Right? They're afraid of being rejected. Fear of reject- they won't try out for a team. Right? They might not make it. So there's a lot of different things that happen in our everyday lives, decisions we make that are like this. We have a fear of rejection. And you take it all the way up to, like, you know, dating, right? Or relations. Well, I don't want to ask her out. She's really pretty, you know, right? So that kind of thing. I don't want to get rejected. And so we have a fear of that. And again, uh, if we're not trying to be emotional tough guys, I would say pretty much everybody. Everybody I see has a fear of rejection. So we talked about anger last week. And this is an important thing to understand. We talked about anger Right, so the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Right? Don't sin. Don't be angry. Don't sin. Don't leave the door open or don't give a place, literally, for the devil. Right? Anger is not a good thing. Not good at all. But fear of rejection is one of those root causes. That's what's under there. Right? The fear of rejection, it leads to all these bad sy- symptoms like the anxiety, the anger, all these different things. But there's something under it. Anger is just a symptom. Like anxiety is just a symptom of something deeper underneath there. So we have to learn how to kind of deal with that. So I'm going to do a teaching that if you've been here for a while, you've heard before. But if you haven't, it's important to hear because it leads down a path that's really, really important. I'm talking a lot lately with uh, close friends, even my wife, about uh, thinking about the Bible rightly thinking about how we really honor and care about God's word. Right? So this is kind of the culture we're doing. If you look at the four points on the wall outside, those are the four things that the early church valued greatly. They were devoted to those four things. And the very first one is the apostles' teaching, I mean, the word. What do you think they're teaching, right? So not like today, right? They're not teaching like, you know, 50 minutes about their dog and you feeling good, right? So it's, it's about the word. They're preaching the word to everyone. They're literally completely devoted to the word. And then the teachings, they're, they're into the word. They want to hear about the word of God. And so that's important. If you're trying to build a Bible-believing church, well, you know, your culture should be built around the word of God. It's very, very important. Thinking about it right. So this teaching, we have a lot of teachings in our society, in our culture about the Bible that are um, not just wrong, but absolutely ridiculous. Like if, if you know the word of God, it's so far off it's not even funny. So maybe you've heard this one. I'll rip the band-aid off. The Bible says, fear not 365 times. Now, everyone who's been here for a while is like, oh, no, here it goes. It's going to be a while. Guys, go get, just get me another coffee. Right? <laughs> I'm going to try to keep this rant short. So the Bible says, fear not 365 times. I've seen it. And here's the thing. If you don't read the Bible, that sounds great. That sounds great. If you're not, 365 times. Okay, here's the thing. I started reading the Bible. And like after a couple passes through in a short period of time, I was like, that does not sound right. doesn't sound anything like the Bible. Now, sure, (laughs) you can find your, you know, fear not verses because, you know, the Bible app will spoon feed it to you. And make sure it doesn't give you any of the ones about fear that you should fear because they want you to come back. Yeah, that's why. So they're, <laughs> they're just going to spoon feed you parts that sound good, but you have no context at all. We talked about reading. Would you read a book like that? One sentence at a time randomly over a period of, oh, like five years or never. Like you never actually finish the Bible because it's just the spoon-fed verses. Right. And so it began to sound really wrong to me. So here's what I did. I got something called a concordance, and it's a really big book with a lot of really small letters <laughs> because it's all the words in the Bible. It tells you where they are. It gives you, like, the Hebrew and the Greek and everything, and so you can literally count, and it's like a crazy person. I did. I got out, like, a little slide, and you're laughing because I asked you for the ruler, and so I was sitting there in my office with the ruler, like, you know, trying to tally, trying to tally, trying to tally. All the times it says fear, and so I had to do it several times. Yes, I'm that nuts. Several times to kind of get the average, right? Because you're going to be off plus or minus a couple here or there. And so when I hit a number twice, that's probably it, 533. 533 times the Bible says fear, New and Old Testament. All right, 
fear not. And it was really conven- convenient, strong concordance. They gave me fear not. I was like, oh, it's so easy because I don't have to find not, put it together. That would have taken a long time. But they put it together. And so tally, 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 tally. Fear not. 84 times. That is not even close to 365. Think about the math this way. Let's say I was off by 16. We're going to bump it up to fear not 100 times. It's not even a third. It's not even a third. Then let's uh, bump the other number down, 500, fear. So then, like, let's say it's around 100 times. Uh, I think, I'm not great at math, but I think that's only 20% of the time it's saying fear not when it talks about fear. Think about that. When the Bible talks about fear, it is only telling you not to fear 20% of the time it talks about fear. How wrong is that teaching? Very. 80% of the time, you should be afraid or somebody's afraid. Not saying fear not. And that's the truth. But it's so popular. Right. Here's the, what it leads to. And this is pastorally why it's a big person. So what's the big deal? Well, <laughs> here's one of them. Here's another teaching I've heard. Fear is a sin. I, I, I just Google it. I'm like, I don't know, because I heard that a lot in church. But I Google it. It's like all over the front page. Yeah, fear is a sin. And all the teachings on it are ridiculous. It doesn't make sense when you look at the whole Bible. Or if you even understand the Gospels, what was Jesus worried about in the agony in the garden? He was horrified and distressed. Good translation will say. Well, does horrified mean you're afraid? Yes. <laughs> yes, it does. And Dr. Luke says he sweat blood. That's an actual medical condition. I have never been that nervous. But when you get, it's from hyper-anxiety. You can sweat blood. Jesus did it. So our Lord sinned? No. But it vividly describes him being anxious. That's interesting. But So how is fear a sin? I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. And when you read the Bible a lot, it doesn't make any sense. It's not really what it says when you look at the full context, aside from pulling one verse out that you happen to like. So it's what we do with the fear. That's kind of what I want to talk to you guys about. You're going to have it. It's just inside of us. It's what we do. And so what's wrong with these teachings? It builds a culture of fake faith. Because you're all afraid of something. Every single one of you. Give me enough time in my office. We'll get to it. Tissues are right there. I know. <laughs> Tissues are right there. <laughs> All right. But we'll get to it. You're afraid of something. You're afraid of something. And we'll get to it. But if fear is a sin, what's half the church going to do or more? I'm not afraid. Well, now you're a liar. <laughs> yeah, you're a liar. Which one's better? Because you are. You're afraid. You have fear of something. So you develop this culture of fake faith. That's what happens. Fake faith culture, a bunch of liars. That's not good. We want to be honest with one another about what we're going through. That's how we get under it. And from my position, this is the kind of thing that I see. A woman comes in. This literally happened. It's not funny. It's just how crazy things get. She comes in, stage four cancer. Stage four cancer. Uh Uh-oh. Scared. Of course. <laughs> so she sits down, but here's the thing. Crying. I know, Pastor, I'm, not, I'm sinning because I'm not supposed to be afraid. There's already the diagnosis. This is bad. And on top of that, she is processing in this horrible spin cycle of guilt, anxiety, you know, just thinking she's sinning. Maybe she's not saved. What? Because of that. That's what it does to people. It's wrong. And so the first thing, now my job, harder, you know, (laughs) okay, wait, back up a couple steps. You are not sinning, and I got to go through this lesson. Okay. But it's so ingrained. It's such a strong infection. Next time I meet with her, she goes through the same thing. Didn't I explain to you? No, because, you know, the internet told me that it's a sin. Great. So, it's not the fear. It's what we do with it. Right? The sin, again, is just a symptom. It's what we're doing with the fear. Is it stopping you? 
Right? So the fear did not stop our Lord from going to the cross. That's the key. As long as it's not stopping us, it's just something we naturally have. It's how we overcome it. We're going to talk about that in one way. So here's the thing, though. What should we fear? I'm just going to give you a couple of examples, just in case you don't believe me. And don't. Read your Bible. <laughs> don't believe me. But everybody in here reads the Bible a lot. They stay because they go, wow. That was actually remarkably true. All I'm doing here is I'm teaching scriptures. That's it. Very little opinion here. So we're going to do three. We could have done like 400, right? No, we're not, I'm not going to do that to you. We'd be here way too long, I think, even for my taste. But I'm going to show you a couple things. This is an NLT. I use a New Living Translation, and a lot of people are surprised. They're like, Pastor, you read Greek. Why would you do that? Well, because right, some people you know, get to a level, and they think, doo, 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 and they're not really teaching anybody anything. No one understands what they're saying. Or, no, I want you to learn. Right? So I could have someone, like a third grader in here. I don't know. It's supposed to be in the kid's area. But anyway, so, <laughs> right? so I could have a young person in here, and I want everybody to know it. But if you know me, when it kind of goes whoop, this way a little too far, I'll bring it back. And this is what I've done. Three scriptures for you. That's really all you need. Proverbs 1.7. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. What is the foundation of knowledge? Fear. Fear. Proverbs 14.16. The wise, if it says are cautious, cross it out. If you're reading a good NLT, there'll be a little asterisk there. Go to the bottom of the page when you see those asterisks or those little letters because it'll say fear. Do you see how this has permeated even our Bible? Think about it for a second. If I'm translating this, Greek Old Testament or the Hebrew, and I go, okay, the wise fear. That's what it says. I'm doing the translation. But then they go, oh, that's going to really step on some toes. Let's put our cautious instead. It's exactly what they did. Why do you want to learn Greek? That's why. And avoid danger. Fools plunge ahead with reckless confidence. The wise fear. What? A lot of things. It's wise to fear. That's what it says. Now, I'm going to, because here's where we get the reverence thing. Have you ever heard that? No, it really just means reverence. Eh, wrong. There are different words for that. It does not even imply reverence at all. That's another false teaching. It's not true. Different words for that. Philippians 2.12, Paul writing, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it's even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with, <coughs> cross that out. It does not say reverence, the Greek word for just like that too. It'll make that noise if you press your pen on the page too hard and get angry. Don't do it. So deep reverence. Reverence is not there in the Greek. Different word for that. Fear and terror is what it says. And if you're a Greek-speaking person, I know there's at least one watching. I put it in there for you. Ooh. I hope I typed it right. But anyway, with fear and terror is what that says. There's a Greek person here. You can do this. Yes, that's what it says in the Greek. Fear and terror. Now, the closest we get in the best translations is fear and trembling. Be careful with that word terror. Why? Because it's terror that connotates trembling, makes you shake. It's that bad. Fear and uh, I'm so afraid that I'm shaking like a leaf. Paul is telling them, work out your salvation with that kind of fear. That's not reverence, my friends. You're not shaken because you're reverent. And it's not the Greek word. So <clears throat> we have two sides of this fear. Right? There is fear that compels us to something good. Fear of the Lord. Working out our salvation. Let's get honest with ourselves about this thing, right? I'd rather work it out here right before I'm before the judge. Let's work it out here. Fear of the Lord. I'll tell you this, when you really have it, it leads to a lot less sin. Right? So you take that fear of the Lord away or you take fear away, well, not afraid to sin. Ah, tricky, tricky. So that's what it does. So Jesus, in one teaching, it's great, and that's because Jesus is great, gives us both sides of this in one teaching. Luke 12, 14. Dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot do any more to you after that. But I'll tell you whom to fear. Fear God, who has the power to kill you and throw you into hell. Yes, he's the one to fear. What's the price of five sparrows? Two copper coins? Yet God does not forget a single one of them. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered, although they're lessening. 
Yeah, for me right now. No, I had to break it up because it's a real hard teaching. <laughs> so don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. I tell you the truth. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, the Son of Man will also acknowledge in the presence of God's angels. But anyone who denies me here on earth will be denied before God's angels. So you see that fear there? I don't tell you whom to fear. Fear God. Jesus is not a liar. So here's that thing. Work it comes together. Work out your salvation with fear and terror. Why? Fear God. Yo. He's what matters. But don't fear people. They can just kill you. And you see the gravity there? Worried about death? Forget about that. <laughs> don't worry about that. Don't worry. That's all they can do. They have nothing to do with your eternal salvation. God does. So worry about that. But fear be afraid of God. It does not say, Jesus is not saying reverence. And when you look at the context, there's no way he's talking about that. That's scary. Who can throw you? Have reverence to God. Who can throw you in hell? No. Fear. Fear that. That's scary. Don't fear people or their rejection of you. And what's the final point Jesus makes? Don't deny me. Don't fear those people so much that you don't talk about Jesus. Because if you don't talk about me, I won't talk about you either. That's what he's saying. Don't deny me. If you deny me, you're too afraid to talk about me in front of people. And what, what's going on here? Pick up your cross and follow me. Why would he say those kinds of things? You might get killed for this. And in the face of that, don't fear them. Don't deny me. We may be rejected especially when we choose to follow this path. We might be rejected by our own. And this is something I know about, so I can speak into it. Major life changes. You get rejected by a lot of people. Talked about it last week just to make some jokes. Right? But I came from the, the martial arts MMA industry. Right? Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was my specialty. They invented the UFC. So <clears throat> anyway, lots of crazy stuff happens in that industry. You ever hear of the phrase locker room talk? <laughs> Yeah, it's a crazy industry. It's a testosterone-driven industry. I mean, think about how crazy you have to be to get into that. I just want to beat people up. I mean, not, you know, I, can, I get that part of it. But you get beat up a lot in the process of learning, and that's what I was talking about, humility. You get tapped out an awful lot working your way up the ranks. You're crazy. I was a crazy person. I was very angry. I was very angry, right? My dad, it was a bad relationship, right? So you'll never call me skinny again, right? <laughs> That's what every one of my opponents, right? Daddy issues, mad and anger. But when I found Jesus, I didn't have that anymore. Anger can be a good motivator for that. <laughs> but it's not in life. I don't have it anymore. It's not there. I don't have the drive I used to have. I'm not interested. And also, I don't want to party with you guys anymore. And dude, you can't keep bringing in over a different girl to my house every weekend who's not your wife. I don't want to drink with you anymore. I don't want to do that anymore, right? I'll have a couple beers, but then that's it. I don't want to get drunk. I don't want to fight with you guys anymore and do all kinds of crazy things. And you know what? I'm tired of being hungover. I'm kind of done with that. I'm in a relationship with Jesus now, which means I can't be in a relationship with all these other things. They're mutually exclusive. They have nothing to do with one another. I'm done with the guilt, the shame, the regret. I'm, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> and then, if this is the way you make your money, and all these other people are relying on you making their money from that, oh, you get rejected a lot. That's really bad. Hey, guys, I just kind of want to be a pastor now. What? That's not you, man. <laughs> That's not who you are. Come on, come party with us, like the rabbit from last week, right? Come be with me. Like, come on, let's go. That's not cool. Let's go party. Let's beat some people up. Let's do what we do. I don't want to do that anymore. Church on Sunday. What? No, man, just come check off the box on Saturday night with me, and then we'll go party right after church. <laughs> That's not the way it works. I can't do this anymore. But here's the thing. The Bible tells us to expect that. The Bible tells us to expect that. 1 Peter 4.4. 4. Of course, 
Your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. So they slander you. But remember that they will have to face God who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. There it is again. Look at that. Don't fear these people that slander you. Don't worry about what they think. Worry about what God thinks. Fear God. That's it. You just, they'll, their haters are going to hate. You just keep doing your thing. Don't worry about what they say. And here's just one little side note, an encouragement I want to give you. <clears throat> to me, in ministry, it's kind of like my job or responsibility. But to you, you're a Christian. There's plenty of places also where it says we're supposed to be examples for people. It's all over the place. Philippians, 1 Peter. We're supposed to be examples for people. And it even says, like, in a marriage, when one person doesn't believe, you can actually, you know, save your spouse, right? You're not saving anyone, but the point is, right, they might see what? Your example, your behavior, and change. They might become a Christian. So our job, through our example, is to try to win people to Jesus, because here's the other side of it, and it's happened a few times for me, where, like, their lives become so unmanageable, such a mess, that they look at you and they go, hold on a second. You know, I'm angry all the time. Why are you not angry? Why do you have joy? You know, why, why do you have peace? How come you love everybody? Or I try to. Right? So why do you, why do you, what do you, why are you kind for the fruit of the Spirit, Right? Peace, love, joy, patience. How come you're so patient? And then they'll start realizing, if they're kind of smart, that you're patient with them. I'm not supposed to be beating them over the head or rebuking them. No, no, no. Attraction, not promotion. Just you, you do you. You just do your thing with Jesus, the relationship. People will notice it. You don't have to say anything. Talked about humility, right? Words. Yeah. Say it with your actions. And they have. They've come around. They'll notice you're making wise decisions. Your life isn't such a mess. They'll notice you're not hung over. And then you do that thing like me. I text them at 7 in the morning and they go, stop! Right? Remember from last week? <laughs> That's a thing. I get plenty. I'm like, oh, he's still drinking. <laughs> right? They don't like that 7 in the morning text. Like, stop drinking. So, and I, you know, but I don't do that. Right? So I'm like really nice. And <laughs> we know it's unspoken. Right? So stop. I'm like, gosh, okay. You know, patient, kind. Not the 10-page text. You're a fool. You're still drinking. Blah, 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 blah. That doesn't win over anybody. Did that in the beginning. That's foolish. No, no. Okay. I love you. Or you say it like in all capital letters. They're like, it's too early for that. <laughs> but I've had people come around. I've had people end of life decisions. I had a friend, long time friend, come back, knew I was a pastor. He came back around. I got to talk him through those final well, months, weeks. And then hours of his life, I like to believe that he came to Christ. He knew where to go. But again, you'll definitely have your haters. And we shouldn't be worried about receiving praise from, especially those people. It's kind of funny. Like, we know they're a mess, but we worry about, like, receiving praise from them. Who cares what they think? And this is addressed if we hop ahead. John 12, 42. Many people did believe in Jesus, however, including some of the Jewish leaders. But they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than the praise of God. They feared people more than God. We should not be seeking the praise of people, especially these types of people, instead of God. We have to adopt Jesus' attitude. Remember Philippians 2, right before that fear and trembling thing. We learned a lot about Jesus being humble. Obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. The ultimate example for us. We also see it in Paul's attitude. And so this is kind of one of the ideas I'm going to close with and then I'll give you a couple other points and we'll eat together. Galatians. <laughs> if you can read Greek, and every friend I have that reads this in Greek, they just laugh. Because it's actually like worse than the American trends. He is going crazy on this church. He calls them fools. He says, if you try to follow law, you're cursed. <laughs> These people who are forcing you into circumcision, essentially, I hope the knife slips. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> That's what he's implying there. So when you read it in the Greek, it's very interesting. So it's almost comical. Why? Because it's the first heresy of the church. First heresy is Jesus fulfilled the law. 
That's what he says in the Sermon on the Mount. People just like, stop reading. Like, no, he fulfills the law. All is accomplished. It's done. But then, what, the Jewish Pharisees who become Christians, maybe, come in and say, you've got to follow the law of Moses. And they put all, them under all these restrictions. Acts 15, they have the council. No, you don't. But anyway, people still come in. Well, they're righteousness trying to do the law. So Paul tees off on them. It's crazy. It's crazy. I'm trying to get there in my preaching. It would be awesome if I could like, do that and actually keep people in the church. But anyway, <laughs> this is what Paul says. So he, he kind of end caps it. First, six chapters. First chapter, six chapter. Look at the idea here. He's clearly knowing that, <laughs> that he's really going to tick a lot of people off here. He knows this. Right? So obviously I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but God, if pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Amen. Ending it. Galatians 6.14, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified, and the world's interest in me has also died. That's Paul's attitude. That's where we need to get, according to the people who think like the world. We go into this knowing we're going to be rejected by it. Last week, we talked about business, right? Being a good employee, these different things, right? So there's your business and none of your business. There's another phrase that can be applied here. What other people think about you is none of your business. What other people think about you is none of your business. We can have peace with this. Why? Many will reject us for this message. But we can have peace. Well, here's the other thing, the acceptance. Like the Samaritan woman. We see that beautiful story here. This is one of the big, like, hows. How do we overcome the rejection? Well, it's not narcissism. It's knowledge of this. You see, we realize that we are brought into the ultimate acceptance. We're accepted into the family of Jesus. He's the king I serve. Got a better one than that? What an honor. This perfect love that we've brought into casts out that fear. That's what it does. Keep the knowledge of that in your mind and in your heart at all times. As cliche as it sounds, yes, you are a child of God. You're a servant of the Most High King. The Lord of Lords, King of Kings, the author of life itself. When you have that perspective in place properly, I don't, you become like Paul. I don't care. I really just don't care what you say. Right? I'm just an ambassador for Christ. That's the message. So we may lose our friends and even family. And we'll look at something interesting. If we jump ahead in Mark, we're going to look at Mark and we're going to see the urgency next week of following Jesus. Immediately, immediately, immediately. He does some healings on the Sabbath. Immediately, immediately, immediately. And then the Sermon on the Mount will get inserted in there. But if you continue in Mark 3, something interesting happens. What happens is his family's there. They're saying, he's out of his mind. Let's take him away. They're calling him crazy. So here's what happened. Mark 3.31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and someone said, Your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he looked around, those around him, and said, Look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. We may be rejected by people who don't believe. We may be rejected by our friends. We may be rejected by our family. But we're accepted into the family of faith. And that's the point. People will call us crazy, as they did Jesus. It doesn't make sense to the world. Read Romans 12. None of that makes sense. I'm going to be a living sacrifice, even to my enemies. Huh? I'm going to love my enemies. That's right. Don't take revenge. The Lord's going to give you the justice. That's the opposite, right? We're supposed to be army of one. Talking about that last week. We get, we do it. We're the Savior. 
No, we're not. God is. But that should be such a relief. Really? Yes, just rely on the Lord. He's got it. We take solace, right? We're humble. Don't exalt ourselves, knowing that they'll be humbled and we'll be exalted. So here's the point. No matter where you've come from as it pertains to the church this morning, you are welcome here. You are part of the family of faith. You are accepted here. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what you did or what you might do. It does. I don't want you to do anything wrong, but it's okay. Come back. Because you're family. You're family. You're a part of the family of faith. You're loved here. We're not bonded by human flesh and blood. We're bonded by the blood of Christ. Amen? So, let me pray from the scriptures and keep this in mind. This will be our closing thought. Better God's word than mine. Colossians 3.1. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ Jesus, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Amen.